I was at the forefront of it all, and I was at the forefront of its acceptance in this country. Being the band leader of a band called Matumbi, we had the privilege of being the backing band for people like Pat Kelly, Ken Booth, Derek Morgan, I Roy, you know, Johnny Clark, and that gave us status. It meant that we knew how to play reggae to their satisfaction. So we did that. And once we'd satisfied them, I embarked on a mission to satisfy us so that we could change the direction or the intention of reggae with groups like Still Pulse, Aswad, the instigators, the investigators, you know, all the groups that were coming up in the UK with the determination to prove that we knew what reggae was about. And furthermore, we were going to change it to suit ourselves. And you didn't come from a musical family, particularly as a creative Yes, family. I did. Did you? You didn't mention that. No, yeah. uh, I mean, but... What, what was it in you? at 12 that made you go, yep, this is it. I had been the first grandson of uh, a musical grandparents where my grandmother, my maternal grandparents, my grandmother played the organ and my grandfather was the choir master in the Seventh-day Adventist church. My uncles, my mother's brothers, had a group where they sang a cappella, only spiritual, but they sang on the radio on Sundays and on religious programs. That afforded me um, my knowledge of harmonies. So when I arrived in the UK, I knew how to play the guitar, I knew how to harmonize, and a lot of kids my age hadn't quite figured that out yet. So I became the person who to say, now you've got to sing that note, and you've got to sing that note, and you've got to sing that note, to make it gel in harmonies. And a lot of people didn't really kind of know that. So I was kind of, as my grandmother put it, the one-eyed man in the blind kingdom. My stepmom says that to my dad. Yeah, yeah. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed the one man, man is, is king. king. That's <laughs> right. So I was the one-eyed man in the land of the blind <laughs> at 12. Um, I've just lost what I was trying to think of. So, um, obviously, Viv was talking about how you were pretty much the only person that took her seriously, and she was mm. this little, you know, young, scruffy, white kid. Who was playing guitar. <laughs> Who was playing guitar. Uh, what was it, what, why, do you, why did you find it so important to be inclusive and to give her a chance when so many others wouldn't? Well, um, I'd been employed by the record company to make sure that this album was going to be a success. And Viv was a young guitarist, and I had been a young guitarist. And so I could give her little tips about, you know, you've got to tune that way, or you've got to trick that string that way if you want to get that particular sound. Because she would confide in me, um, I want to sound like whatever. And, and outside of the studio, she would play her guitar to me. And I would go, it's beautiful. You know, um, you don't have to be Mark Knopfler, right? You be Viv Albertine, and I will tone your guitar and make the right amplification so that it's bold and proud, you know? And she had a girly way of playing the guitar that I thought, you know, was very, very nice. And um, it reminded me of my own sisters playing guitar, right? But they weren't brave enough to, to join a band or anything, but they played. And uh, there was Viv who was playing and not quite sure of herself in some respects. So I was there to assure her that what she was doing was the right thing to fit with the song that they'd written. And she had some very odd guitar parts. If you listen to the Slits album, you will see that the guitar is bordering on reggae, it's bordering on funk, it's bordering on scratch, it's bordering on everything. And, and she had managed to encompass all those styles and made them her own. 
And also, uh, it was touched upon that you've got quite an eclectic music taste, whereas a lot of people, I guess, would just kind of stick to one or the other. Again, what was it that drew you to listening to everything and not just sticking to the stereotypical, you know, you're a black man, let's listen to black music? Well, what had happened was that I'd grown up listening to gospel music, and gospel music really has no colour. It's the soul. So when I came to London and uh, was listening to the Rolling Stones and the Who and the Beatles and people like that, I began to be able to appreciate what they were trying to do or what they were actually doing and align myself with it until Jimi Hendrix came along and I thought, yes, all bow down, bow your heads, the god of the guitar has arrived and... I haven't been wrong because he died at 27 years old and some of his guitar playing is yet to be equaled. So, and I was quite proud that there was a black guy who played guitar and he was like the king of the guitar. It wasn't Eric Clapton, you know, it wasn't um, any one of, it wasn't Keith Richards, you know, it, it was none of them, but Jimi Hendrix came and stood head and shoulders above them in rock music that showed that music really had no color. You know, music is what you make it, you know, and he proved that. And there was no boundary for me after that. It was like, I can do what I want. You know, only my uncle banging on the, the door of the rehearsal room going, tune your guitar, tune your guitar. I'm going, what's he talking about? It sounds all right. But then as I grew older, I realized that I might have been slightly out of tune, but it didn't matter at 13.